You've heard it said that God loves fire and brimstone, but Jesus said he loves mercy. Jesus loves clearing up misconceptions about the faith. In fact, from the Sermon on the Mount up until now, Jesus has been challenging and doing actions that are literally irritating uh, the religious elite at that time because he is breaking some of their rules, not God's rules, but their interpretations thereof. They had led such a strict life and such an overcomplicated interpretation of the Old Testament scriptures that as Jesus goes along healing and showing and preaching the good news and showing that he is the Messiah by the miracles that he is doing, he is also doing some actions and doing some healings at certain times that really aggravate uh, others. And the whole point is to really get the point across. He really expects us to have common sense as the way that he talks about how we observe the Sabbath, how we observe mercy, how we should observe our faith. And uh, again, Jesus said many times that he did not come to overturn the Old Testament. He did not come to obliterate anything, not even one little stroke of the pen. But he said he did come to interpret it correctly so that we can know the heart of God instead of just this mechanical process of obedience that didn't produce any type of holiness inside the people of the day. It was just this strict obedience that, again, Jesus criticized them for saying their hearts aren't tender to God and uh, they complicate people's lives to the point of being overburdened. And that's not what God wants. So uh, all this being said, Jesus, his common sense, also wants to liberate us from uh, religious trauma, as it were, or from religious uh, uh, requirements that some people think they have to do, but that they don't have to do. Really, God wants to be our God and us to be our people, his people. He wants us to be close to him. He wants to write his laws on our heart. He wants us to just naturally do what is right instead of having to have a religious rigmarole in order to get something done. And so let's just gather together as God's people, read his word, let it affect our hearts, and then we act accordingly to each other and to the Lord. So here we're into Jesus breaking the Sabbath, or he is accused thereof in chapter 12 of Matthew. And it's a pretty interesting series of events that happens and a couple different things that he teaches us along the way. And that's going to help us to understand the nature of the Sabbath. What does it mean for the regular person? What does it mean for the priestly caste? What does that mean for even um, the as a sign for the Messiah. And then what also does that mean, again, for us in learning proper interpretation of scripture and obedience? Because Jesus desires mercy over sacrifice. So let's look into it and we'll go from there. So starting at verse one. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you'd not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue. A man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you has a sheep that falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. He said to the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted, how they might kill Jesus. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. A large crowd followed him, and he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. This was to fill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant, whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel and cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he has brought justice through to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. So one of the things that probably stood out to you was they're wanting to kill Jesus over the Sabbath breaking. And you might be thinking, if you're just reading this or learning this now, well, that escalated quickly. Well, let me give a bit of a background on the Sabbath so that we can understand what it is and what Jesus is trying to teach here for us 
uh, here now. First and foremost, the Sabbath was introduced to the Hebrews under the reign of Moses when he led them out of Egypt through the Red Sea and God gave them the law on Mount Sinai. It was to reflect out of Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy 5, which is where the Ten Commandments are, as one of the ten, as a really important thing for the people to do, to be in like kind to what God did in creation, where in six days he created the world and the seventh day he rested. That does not mean that God was tired and needed a rest. That meant the word rest would be more like what we would say, uh, relaxation, you know, to sit back and to enjoy what we have. Not that we need to recuperate from anything. We, on the other hand, do need to recuperate, and God recognized that. So part of it is uh, to why we can rejuvenate, is to rejuvenate in the presence of the Lord. So that's why we worship on a Sabbath. That's why it was introduced to worship uh, and to do no work on the Sabbath, even food preparation. If you wanted to prepare, you were allowed to eat, but you weren't allowed to prepare food. You had to prepare your food the day before. And uh, you basically like eating leftovers as it were on the Sabbath day or just simply fasting. And the idea was for spiritual rejuvenation as well as bodily rejuvenation. And see, this is where it gets a little bit um, uh, delicate for the Pharisees who were strict religious uh, interpreters of the old covenant. So when it said, don't work, you know, you're allowed to eat only leftovers. You're not allowed to do any work regarding the food. So even the idea of just rubbing the heads together of it and to eat it, um, maybe it'd be like you thinking you're eating pistachios. You got to just take the thing off. You're like, well, it's not much work, but it was still kind of on the borderline of is it work or isn't work? Because you were allowed to pick stuff and eat it, but you weren't allowed to harvest anything. So the line that they're trying to thread here is, are his disciples doing work by simply rubbing the grains together. It wasn't that they were eating them that was the problem. It was that it wasn't even that they were picking them because that was lawful. But had they blurred the line into being uh, into harvest mode and Jesus is telling them obviously not. Now there was a, a law that was also to help the poor and the travelers uh, and in a certain area that you weren't allowed to uh, harvest the edges of your field so that people as they walk by they'd be able to have some food. You know no convenience stores back in those days and everyone really did have a very communal understanding um, that yes even though there'd be someone who owned the field and would gain the major profits over all of it if there's still an expectation a law to not exclude others from being able to enjoy your um, your property and to then glean some from it. So picking was also a sign for people to go when they're hungry, then go grapes, whatever it may be that you're growing, they can take. They're not allowed to harvest. It says don't put it in your bag. If you're poor and you're hungry and you see a field, you're allowed to go over to it and you're allowed to eat from it. And But you're not supposed to A, be a glutton and B, take with you. That's breaking into harvesting, which is then then crosses the line for them into stealing uh, from that landowner. And um, and so this is what these guys are doing. So it's not like they were stealing from some guy. They were allowed to go in and do it. But um, uh, but with this, Jesus is teaching here that, uh, that that little bit of work that they're doing isn't actually work. Then Jesus goes on to point out a few things. And uh, he, he, they would have revered David, so they bring up he brings up David, where David went into uh, the holy place to take the consecrated bread. And he wasn't allowed to do it. And it wasn't right. But he needed food to go on his journey as he was escaping from Saul to go uh, on the run. And so Jesus is here teaching a greater good scenario saying that, yes, the Sabbath is uh, to be observed. And uh, yes, the laws, there's some laws that are um, what we'd say general laws uh, versus absolute laws. You know, for example, in the book of Proverbs, there's many wise sayings that have no spiritual obligation on you that you're going to have a judgment if you don't do it. But your life will just be harder if you don't do it. So if there's some advice given on what is wise action in the book of Proverbs, but you don't heed it uh, unless it's one that's actually moral. But, um, you know, you're not supposed to do certain things in the presence of a king, it says. Don't be a glutton in front of a king. That just looks bad. Um, <laughs> you know, don't, don't just take advantage because now you're at a feast that you, you, you act uh, like a glutton. He goes, that's going to get you disfavor with, with the king if you end up sitting in front of a noble or the king himself. And so that's just a piece of wisdom that has no eternal consequence. It has no spiritual consequence. God's not going to love you more or less, and you're not going to be judged if you do or don't do that in front of a king. And so the, there's things that are taught in the Bible that just are going to make your life a lot better, that are common sense, that just make life easier. And then there's next, there's general rules that are like, you need to do this. This is a, this is a command that unless there's a real reason to um, step away from, you just simply obey it. And, uh, and then the next, there's absolute laws, ones that we don't break ever, no matter what. And uh, this is where a lot of people don't quite get the Bible, um, where you have so many different interpretations of it even here and today, is uh, 
it's easy for people who are faithful and just want to obey everything. We can have a tendency to make everything ironclad. None of it is ever able to be moved. None of it is able to ever be like everything is always absolute. But that's just simply not the case with a lot of things. And uh, we must pursue what is right. We must pursue obedience and uh, and limit our own selves. But we do have to realize that uh, there's many examples to which God has broken uh, what his generalized command was for a greater good for him. Now, that gets into a slippery slope because if you go from, you know, being a super legalistic church, which you could be calling everything absolute, to one that anything goes or you interpret it based upon my own feelings. Can I encourage you with this? If you know there's a general rule in scripture and you think that there's opportunity for exceptions and you're always going for the exception for your own enjoyment or your own ease, um, you, you might be in the wrong. And I say that again, not the finger wag, but the greater good, this is why we ask uh, when we run into things of exceptions, we get a body of believers together. And am I just looking for an exception because I want one or it's because it's God's greater good in this moment? And that's hard to discern when it's related to you. This is why we even have laws in, in our uh, civil world about conflict of interest, that we have such a bias to ourselves that we will twist things and otherwise do things that are wrong, but yet somehow interpret that they're right. So we have conflicts of interest. We know that we have an interest involved. We're supposed to limit our authority on it. And so if you're looking for the greater good and you're helping somebody else say, you know what, I, I think you can kind of like not do that. Um, for example, you could be absolved from observing the Sabbath if your mother or father died. You were allowed, if it was life or death was on the line, you were allowed to take a medicine if the, if you thought you might actually die that day. And uh, so there was exceptions for the Sabbath, even in the Old Testament, of what one could do. But if you're always breaking it because it's just something you want to do and not, you know, get other people involved is what I, I guess I'm getting at, to see if you're, you get those people as a check balance to make sure those who don't have an interest in that particular uh, affair that you can't that they can help you to understand what God's will is. And that by far is the number one reason for ever taking one of God's general rules, like rest on the Sabbath and breaking it. It's not so that we can go do whatever we want. Um, we're actually told that when people go and do whatever they want, find these exceptions that is repugnant to God. And it always must be when we are uh, deviating from a general uh, command is that we're doing it because we want to increase our faithfulness to the Lord. We're using it to to have the greater good of God being about. And Jesus and his disciples are doing just that. They're going around town to town, village to village, a lot of walking. They would have needed to eat. It was a big operation and they were hungry. So they ate and they're healing people. They're preaching the good news. They're doing lots of great work. And, uh, and so on top of that, we learn that Jesus is teaching. David broke it and you don't condemn him for it because you he's already telling them, look, you already look for the greater good. Why aren't you looking for the greater good here, Pharisees? Why are you just looking for a chance to accuse me? Why aren't you looking uh, as a you could see a tree produces fruit of all the good that is happening here and think maybe God is doing something really good here. And instead of getting legalistic and getting all, uh, uh, you know, their backs up, they should have been leaning into and receiving what Jesus was doing. So it's a bit of a subtle rebuke here that he starts off with. And then he goes on to tell them, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And he wants them to go figure out what that means. And this is one of uh, two major things that Jesus teaches on. We're talking about common sense and what he's doing to bring into the world. He's not coming to take anything away from, but he's bringing a proper interpretation. And the proper interpretation isn't one of strict legalism. It is one of mercy that produces holiness. It is a mercy over just a sacrifice. It's one thing to go out there and do a rite or to do rituals and to do them perfectly while you're denying doing the heart of the matter to help somebody else. And so here we go. He's saying, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. We should be looking at the world with a way of mercy of when we see things that maybe not going as religiously right as we thought it was or how we think the world should go as it relates to Christianity. We should be thinking with mercy on our, on our brains first so that any discipline that needs to happen if you're a church leader uh, to help someone else any uh, or a parent for that matter any um, intervention or any type of conversations uh, see these guys are intervening to be legalistic and to be harsh Jesus is saying you should be having mercy on the mind because clearly God loves his people he's interested in them he made a perfect creation and we botched it and he didn't leave us alone <laughs> you know he came back to want to save us and he's offered us a heaven if we just simply have faith in his son. And, uh, and trusting him for salvation for what he did on Calvary, dying for our sins so that we could be freed from sins, which is what he wants from us, to be freed from sins. And, uh, and so this is, and he says, mercy is what does that. 
And Jesus demonstrated that. Jesus didn't do a top-down approach. He didn't come in as a conquering warrior, which is what they expected, and to be a king and then to set up these rules and then bam, we're going to put down the hammer on all these laws and we're going to control the people and they're going to be holy. It didn't work before and Jesus isn't going that way again. He's going and inviting people to look at things through the heart of the matter with mercy on your mind towards everybody that you see because you don't know what they have gone through and you don't know what they're going through. And if you're in a privileged position to be able to help somebody in their faith, always have mercy on the mind of this person needs to be healed. This person needs to be restored. This person is loved by God. And uh, we don't want to sideline anybody because there's a lot of work to do here left before Christ returns. And we need to have everybody in the game. And mercy and restoration and taking things seriously is exactly what we will do and what Jesus has asked of us to do. So he takes this example of them eating on the Sabbath and, and rubbing the kernels together as an example to be able to teach these Pharisees how to shift their thinking because he's already run into them quite a few times. The opposition has already uh, started to get strong against him that he's not doing things the way that they want them done. Remember, Jesus is the new wineskin and his church uh, as led out by the sending out of the 12, is the new wineskin. And what did he say? If you put new wine and old wineskins, they burst. Well, the Pharisees are bursting because they just uh, have got their old regimented thinking and Jesus is teaching something new. Not new content, new understanding, so that it affects the heart and that we can simply just be free to love one another and love God as the first and second command commands. So next about the Sabbath, we see him going to a synagogue as they're still going out to heal. Uh, remember what I said about you're allowed to break the Sabbath with life and death. You were allowed to pick food, but you weren't allowed to harvest it. Um, so they already got them on the wondering about, is that work or not? This one for sure they know is not, according to the Pharisees, because a man with a shriveled hand is not life and death. He can come back tomorrow and get healed, would have been their thinking. So the man with the shriveled hand, whatever kind of uh, issue he may have had, Jesus gets up and he uses it again as an example because they've been following him. And he says, is it lawful to heal a man or to do bad? And he, he challenges them again on their own stinking thinking. He goes, look, if somebody falls into a pit, you're going you're gonna to help them out. If your sheep falls in, you're going to do what is, is, come on, guys, use your common sense. Yes, you're supposed to rest. Yes, you're supposed to worship. Yes, you're supposed to pursue God very seriously on the Sabbath. Um, but when you see good that needs to be done, then just do it. And so this is where Jesus does introduce the command, it is lawful to do what is good on the Sabbath. And by the way, this whole idea of doing good on the Sabbath was a contemporary, um, when I look at other Jewish literature of the era, that was a contemporary uh, you know, battle that they were trying to figure out because they thought it seemed heartless to not want to do it. Mainly because there was like this group of people who were like, made the Pharisees look you know, like they weren't pious. They're the guys that wrote the, and stored the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Qumran community. Those guys, they believed that even if a man fell into a lake or off a cliff and there was no easy way for him to get out, that if you were to go get a ladder or a rope or any kind of device to rescue that man, you were violating the Sabbath and you were to leave the man alone. It's like, yikes, that strict observance is allowing bad to happen. And this is what Jesus is getting at. So he's entering into a, a contemporary debate and he's giving the answer. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Jesus is also teaching them to value life. Because he says, he gives the example of the sheep, and then he goes on to say, hey, are people worth more than sheep? With an exclamation point. It's like, we are need to be able to do good no matter what is in our way, no matter what is going on. Now, for us in the New Testament, we understand in Colossians chapter 2 and 3 that Jesus is our Sabbath day rest. He is the fulfillment of the Sabbath that he gives us rest for our souls, forgiveness of sins. And uh, and so the early Christians, they broke with the Sabbath uh, and kind of changed it to Sunday from what would be Saturday, which, by the way, those are Roman names for the days of the week and not Hebrew. So we're all off if you want to be super strict and say it's Saturday. Well, no, it wasn't Saturday because they didn't use the word Saturday. <laughs> but again, uh, the, the first day of the week, last day of the week, however you want to describe it, we learned that the early Christians being kicked out of the synagogues because they considered uh, believing in Christ as a deviation from Judaism. And so the legalists won in the first century from at least a property point of view. And the um, and so these people uh, filled with the spirit went out and they met in people's homes, but they would gather on the Sunday, which was uh, considered the resurrection Sunday. So the day that Jesus conquered death, the day that he proved that he, uh, that sin was dealt with, that became their day. And that's why we've kind of called the Sunday our Sabbath today, even though it wasn't from a Jewish point of view. Um, but it, it is now because we're honoring the day that our Lord raised. Uh, yeah. So if you're wondering, can you 
what do we do? How many people have to work on Sunday? What do you do when, you know, so we try to think of the greater good and we say like, you know, we really should uh, be taking times apart to rest. We're told to rest. We're not good people when it comes to rest. We just get ourselves so overworked and stressed out that it even affects our own health. And so I want to encourage you. There are spiritual benefits to making sure that you are in worship with others. There are spiritual benefits to uh, getting closer to God. There are physical benefits from actually taking a day and taking a break and enjoying it while doing good. And some have even argued that observing a day in today's day and age is not necessary because Jesus fulfilled the Sabbath. So just as long as we periodically have rest and times of worship with the Lord, then uh, then that works. It's like, well, I, I do think there is a case for that. But when I look at humanity, uh, I see how easy we are distracted how easily we get off kilter. And by having a structured day, so if you have to be a shift worker and you can't work on Sundays, you know, we have another service we do on Wednesdays. It's like, just take take a day to dedicate to your personal growth with the Lord and to worship uh, and to doing good. And you'll see just how much it will change your life. And why don't you just try it? I know most people don't, but why don't you just try it and see what happens in your life? So this is going to flip me over to people working on Sunday or the Sabbath, depending on what Old or New Testament that you're in. If you notice here, Jesus also said that the priests are working on the Sabbath because they're in charge of the worship. So, of course, you had to prepare and you had to do a lot of stuff, including the sacrifices, including the reading, including the go get the scriptures, which one scroll you're going to read from today. And because they were working like like me, I work on a Sunday. It's like my busiest day of the week. <laughs> and uh, and it's a heavy load, too, because not only just with the organization, not only with preparing this message to give to you, to do good study and delivery, but to organize the ministries and as well as to counsel those who are here. You know, I stay here much longer than most people on Sundays, well, than everybody, uh, as we have an opportunity to pray for people, to hear their concerns, to help people understand what's going on in their life from a biblical point of view, uh, so they can have good counsel to go out and make good decisions. And so that's a heavy day for me. And it's like, so technically I'm breaking the Sabbath, just as Jesus said the priests do. So he's again pointing out that even now, so there is there is exceptions, even in the Old Testament, for the common person, the person who wasn't a priest, to be able to break the Sabbath. Now he goes on to say, priests break the Sabbath every Sabbath. And that is okay. They're seen as innocent. You know, they were required at other times to take their break, as it were. And uh, and so as we as we look at that, so Jesus given them all of their, their exceptions, but then he goes on to point out, uh, and he gives these examples of the healing and everything else. But then it goes on to point out at the end of this that I had read the last few verses, the last five, is that Jesus is the Messiah. So if the priests are excluded from that because of the worship duty to help the other people to worship, how much more is the Messiah, the one that they have been waiting for? So he uses like a lesser to greater examples throughout here. Here's how it affects the common folk. Here's how it affects the priestly class. Well, look at this. I'm the Messiah. And this is why Matthew puts all of this together and why he's putting all of these teachings together, because it's showing where Jesus is aggravating the religious establishment. He is aggravating them by living out the intended uh, interpretation of these Old Testament scriptures, which is funny. He's just simply teaching and living out the heart of the law, and it is driving the people who are supposed to be the faithful people batty. That is really interesting. So uh, let's pay attention to make sure that we don't get upset when somebody is helping people to grow in their faith and doing good and showing mercy along the way. Um, we'd be wise to pay attention to such people as that. So it says now that they've uh, that Jesus is obviously uh, proclaiming that he is the Messiah yet again. I don't know how many times I've already been telling you that the whole, uh, this whole series. And now they're at the point that they're saying, this guy's blasphemous. Uh, they see he's too far out of our religious norms, and he's got to be doing all these good things by the power of the devil. So he's not only just like this cool guy that's doing great things. They're like, this guy's a really big problem. This guy's a really big stumbling block, and everybody's following him, and we need to deal with this. Well, when the Romans came in, they took away from different places local authority to be able to execute somebody. And so they have to go plot, because it says if someone desecrates the Sabbath on person and badly, they're supposed to be executed. It's a capital offense. So it says they go up to plot to kill Jesus, which means they have to get the chief priests. They have to get they're sending letters down to Jerusalem. They got to get the local magistrates on board. Uh, and eventually they do. 
And Jesus knows his time is short. So he uh, knows that I'm going to stay away from these guys in this crowd. So I'm going to go continue my work because it needs to get done before I get found out. So he's just trying to go and let's see how many people I can help before these guys kill me. And so this is why he withdraws. He's, that's, his withdrawal is not any way of him saying he's not the Messiah. It's his way of not is making sure that he doesn't have that appointment on Calvary too soon. He had to die at the appointed time and he had to make sure that he was there then. So he withdrew. And so with this, by his continued actions, the word just kept spreading that this is the Messiah. And uh, Matthew includes this uh, these few verses out of Isaiah to show that Jesus is the long-awaited one. And he didn't do what you thought he would do. He didn't come from the top down, and he wasn't super legalistic. He came in gentle, with mercy, and he came in on a grassroots level and sent out his disciples the same. That he thinks mercy should spread throughout the whole world. Uh, like a virus, but in a good way, that we can have mercy go out and growing and having the heart after God's as we continue our daily lives here on this earth. And so I'll just kind of leave you that again, that Jesus expects a common sense. He expected that out of them. He teaches in a common sense way that this is why, it's not just this is an, uh, uh, something to do, do it. He says, this is why you should do it, because it's the better to get you closer to God so I can get you home to heaven with me so we can take as many people with us along the way. And that is how we're supposed to interpret this. How is this going to benefit the greater good for all of humanity? And if we continue doing so, then we too will be known as people with common sense, and that people will trust us when we teach them the way of mercy, and then they will come to know the Lord. And I pray that if you haven't known the Lord yet, that you simply follow him. He is gentle, as we learned, and uh, he is merciful. But he's also real serious, so we can't take advantage of his, uh, of his mercy. We need to understand that at an appointed time, he's going to make us give an account. But he is merciful. He is loving. And he is purposeful in his discipleship of us. And so I want to thank you for coming to church with me today. I pray that you trust in the Lord uh, even more today than you did yesterday. And we'll see what God can do with us together. God bless you. Have a good one. Let's do something together. Life is better in community. So let me encourage you to reach out to us via the Connect card that you'll see in the description at the bottom of this video. That's your opportunity to just say hi. Let us know you're watching. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Or maybe you have some questions about faith, about our church, um, or about life in general. We're here to help you and we're happy to do so. I'd also like to thank those who are faithfully giving. I can't express my thanks enough. We're able to continue ministry in our community and abroad um, so wonderfully because of your faithfulness of giving the Lord's tithes and your offerings. So to go above and beyond his tithes is just incredible. And so for those of you who uh, want to come and visit us, please know that our service is a gift to you. We never ask for anything uh, as, from our guests. As a Christian, it is my act of worship to give to the Lord. And each one of us Christians uh, believe that. So if you want to come check us out, there's no pressure. Just come on over. Uh, if you did want to give, we have simple ways. Give at regalchurch.com for your e-transfer, no password required. You can drop it in the offering plate on Sundays, or you can drop through the to the office um, through the week. Just pop in, say hello, and uh, let us know who you are, and uh, we'd be happy to chat with you. Uh, we can also set up automatic deposit. We'll just send you the simple form, and you fill it out and send it back, and it's good to go. So thanks for your time, and God bless you. Thank you.